Morning from Miami Beach, this is Dr. John Bennett from Neurosurgical TV. We are honored to have the third webinar of the Chinese Neurosurgical Journal. And I'll introduce right away Wan Li Zhao, a neurosurgeon from Beijing. Welcome, Wan Li. Hi, uh, yeah. Thank you, John. Okay, so shall we start? Uh, sure. Do you want to introduce okay. John, please? Sure. Uh, okay. Uh, good evening, uh, everyone all around the world <clears throat> from Beijing. Uh, this is the third webinar of uh, our Chinese Neurosurgical uh, Journal, a, a special channel of Neurosurgical TV. And tonight we will have uh, three uh, speakers. And uh, please allow me uh, to introduce the first uh, speaker John Adler, uh, as I guess most of the neurosurgeons all around the world know, uh, know him, and he's the professor of neurosurgery from uh, Stanford University, and uh, as we know, he's the father of uh, CyberKnife. Uh, tonight, he will uh, give us a, a special uh, speech, uh, talk about a new uh, website uh, named uh, cureus.com, uh, uh, a new age for map, uh, medical uh, publishing. So uh, please, uh, Professor. Yes, Professor Adler. Uh, I'm, I come from Huashan Hospital. You know Huashan Hospital, oh. uh, we have the uh, two cyber knives. Oh. Uh, one yeah. is the latest <laughs> model. <laughs> Thank you for the sub, cyber knife. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Professor Xu is uh, uh -huh. yeah. He's the co-hoster uh, of mm -hmm. of this special uh, channel. Yeah. Well, I love Washington Hospital. Well, well, I have many Chinese friends, but uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to show you at my final slide something even newer than the cyber knife. Son of cyber. Okay. Great. So just one slide. But most I want to talk about uh, uh, a website that I've worked on for more than ten years and. Uh, it is a different way to publish medical knowledge called curious. It, that word in English means kind of two things at the same time. One is it's a, it's a play on the word curious to be thinking imaginatively and in new ways. The other is cure us. How do you cure diseases together? And so it's a different way of medical publishing. And in the end, a uh, little like the journal, the Chinese Journal of Neurosurgery, it's about eliminating barriers to the generation, curation, and the dissemination of medical knowledge. So, um, you know, the world of medical publishing is a big world. And there are, as you know, lots of different ways to go about publishing. But it's also pretty clear that this publishing is very, very important in the world of healthcare. Over the last year during COVID, we've seen how decisions made by government affecting billions of people have all been reported and first described through medical journals. So medical journals are critically important in the world. And of course, as neurosurgeons, we know how important it is to our own specialty. The future is decided by what's published in journals. However, journals also have not changed very much over literally hundreds of years. Journals, started with things like you know, Nature and Lancet, New England Journal of Medicine, and they're hundreds of years old, these medical journals. But increasingly, they become harder to access. They become very expensive. Even wealthy, wealthy universities like Harvard and Stanford find it hard to pay for subscriptions to these journals. And in fact, the vast majority of physicians in the world the vast majority of neurosurgeons in the world often don't have access to the critical knowledge in medical journals. Meanwhile, many journals have become obsessed with impact factor. And in fact, many of the observations, some of the most important observations in medical history would never be published in modern journals because they lack the, what, the significance that medical journals are looking for today. Things like the discovery of penicillin, things like the description of anesthesia at Mass General in New England Journal of Medicine would never be published today. 
And so fortunately, journals have held back medical progress. And I wanna point out a special shout out to Ms. Tu, who won the Nobel Prize, really developed on the work of ancient observations around the use of, what was it, red rice rust and the ability to regulate human cholesterol. That kind of observational science by thousands of, over thousands of years of traditional Chinese practitioners would never get published in today's journals. And yet it was eventually important enough that it led to her Nobel Prize. So because of the problems in some traditional medical journals and, in the, and growing up here in Silicon Valley, I have spent the last decade thinking about a new generation kind of medical journal, medical knowledge platform. Curious is a little bit different than other journals because we believe that all medical knowledge, if done, written credibly, deserves to be published. We don't believe in rationing healthcare or medical knowledge. We want to open it up to as wide a community of publishers as possible. So much publishing today is just done among the best universities of the world. But 99% of the physicians who oftentimes make important observations like I just described, like penicillin, like anesthesia, we want them to have access to journals as well. And so this new journal is very much a new generation concept, free for all, but also very tightly integrated with social media. In fact, we think journals were the very first types of social networks. And we're taking advantage of that to have a new business model and to dramatically lower the cost of publishing. So in Curious, we have gone out of our way to integrate tightly with social media. In fact, a medical article is merely user-generated content around which we build a social interaction. By doing that, we are very much like the modern internet. We are thereby able to make publishing highly affordable. We publish one third of all articles for no cost and two thirds we charge uh, only $300, which is the lowest cost in the industry. And we enable very fast publication times. The average time from submission to publication is only two weeks. I think of it a lot like posting on a form of social media. Of course, you have different social media in China than we do in America, but you know how instantaneous it is. The difference is that social media and curious is always peer reviewed and it formats and it's done in a way that closely follows the traditions of both peer review and medical publications. And once published, this content is available to the world. And increasingly, we find patients want to read this content, not just physicians. So we have some authors who can publish even in days. The way Curious works is it's a user-generated HTML page. So the, the author does a lot of the work, not the journal, the author. And that's how we can keep costs so low and make the process so fast. And once authors become familiar with this, they can oftentimes publish their article just a few days because peer review also happens very quickly. We call it template-driven publication. So the peer review process is somewhat familiar to anyone who publishes in journals today. In Curious, it is a single blind peer review. And we're currently publishing about half of all articles that are submitted. Some articles we would like to publish, but they're just not good enough quality. And if the authors will spend more time and effort, we will often publish articles, but we find that and once again, 50% of articles just aren't good enough. Of note, 
Over 60% of articles are published in only two weeks. It's a very vast publication cycle. Once published, we subject all articles to what we call SIQ. It's scholarly impact quotient. It is a way of measuring the intellectual importance of an article. All readers are invited to score the impact of the quality of the published article. And what we find is that collectively, when many, many, many people score the importance of the article, you get a new measure of importance that is in some ways better than impact factor. We hope to get our impact factor next year, but we think that SIQ closely complements impact factor and in the long run may be more important because it reflects not the quality of the journal, it reflects the quality of an article. And ultimately is the quality of the article, articles that decide the importance of a journal and the impact factor. Like the journal of neurosurgery, Chinese journal of neurosurgery, we believe in open access. So 100% open access. And of course, as you know, much of the world is moving towards open access. Although only 20, 25% of articles are open access today, it is growing quickly. And my understanding is even in China, there's a big move afoot to support this Plan S, which comes out of Europe. Someday, it is likely in the next two decades, almost all articles will be open access. But to publish open access in nature cost $11,000. That's a lot of money for anybody, even in Western countries, wealthy countries. So Curious is able to keep its, its publication process so low cost because we use the author to help do a lot of the work that traditional journals often do. So we have a, we use different types of tools and internet technologies. You would not know about TurboTax, but that's in America, that's how authors, I mean, that's how taxpayers submit their tax return through software, sophisticated software. We have like not Uber, in China you had Didi, where one moment you can get a driver if you need it. In our world, we have copy editors who jump on and jump off or from low cost countries like the Philippines, Ireland, and in India. And then lastly, we have this community engagement, which I described SIQ, which is like what we see in WeChat when people interact in and around user generated content. The community interacts, also something that we have in Facebook in America. So not, you may not know about Curious, but Curious is growing very quickly. We published 8,400 articles last year, and we continue to grow at, 50, at a rate of 60, 70% a year, year over year after year. And so we, we had over 16, 16 million page views last year. Uh, this year, we're expecting close to 40 million page views this year. As the journal continues to grow, just time after time after time. With 40 million page views, we will be one of the busiest journals in the world. So last year, we had 16,000 articles submitted. I'll add that in total, we published 1,000 neurosurgery articles. But all these numbers continue to grow year after year. Once again, 16,000 articles submitted, over 8,400 articles published, about 50%. So when we add in PubMed page views, uh, our articles were read, curious articles were read 30 million times last year. This year, we expect to be over 50 million between Curious and PubMed reads. 50 million is a pretty big number. And we're quite confident that we will be even much bigger in the years to come. So Curious currently has 12,000 worldwide registered neurosurgical users and authors. Um, and we have close now, we have, uh, in fact, we have over 300,000 registered members. 
Now, I suspect, I don't know how many neurosurgeons you have in China, but you may well have 10,000 neurosurgeons in China. And we'd love to, of course, have even more neurosurgeons participate in our journal. And it's a great way to get your, get your articles read quite widely. Last year, we had a few articles that were read between a half a million and a million times. An individual article was read a half a million times. So as you can see, Curious continues to grow quickly. The United States represents about half of our authorship, about half of our users and reviewers, but we certainly have representation throughout the world quite widely. China, however, is very underrepresented, and we would urge you to consider our journal, especially if it's non-neurosurgery material, or you want a broader audience, especially if you want an audience outside the United States. Please consider Curious. You'll note that we, half of our articles are by young people, 34 and yes. But our most published author is Shane Tubbs, the, the editor-in-chief of Gray's Anatomy, who's published uh, close to 200 articles over the last several years. So while we're still a small journal, given all the number of articles in the world, we think we can be publishing close to 10% of all medical articles in the next four years. In fact, in the next three years, we're quite confident that Curious will be the largest medical journal in the world, reaching an audience of more than 100 million. So it's a, an audience that includes physicians, there are surgeons, of course, but increasingly numbers of patients, because patients want to know what state-of-the-art medicine is. And we look at it that is a human right. So please come check out Curious. Obviously, it's free to sign up and read and uh, would welcome appropriate publications in Curious as well if it doesn't fit inside the Chinese Journal of Neurosurgery. And so uh, this, I already showed this. So please, if you want to learn more, just uh, reach out me through Curious or at Stanford. I'm pretty accessible in the world today. And lastly, I just want to show you not only that this was as proud of it as I am of the CyberKnife, I want to show you the son of CyberKnife, the first such brain and head and neck radio surgery machine, which is really a combination of a gamma knife and a cyber knife and something different. And it does not require radiotherapy vault. So it goes very easily in a neuroscience center. It goes easily in a, in a neurosurgery clinic right next to your patients. And this machine is designed to deliver the best radio surgery in the world and also do it for much less price cost than was ever possible before. And so this is the ZAPX, and I like to call it the son of the cyber knife. And while we have one installed at uh, PLA 301, I hope that we'll have many more installed over the next few years in China. Once China opens up, I intend to visit all my many friends there. So thank you, Yuan Li. Thank you, Bin Zhu. You know, it's uh, nice to be able to present to what I'm doing at Curious. And also just remind you, I'll be there soon to talk about the ZAPX. Thank you. Ah, thank, thank you, you. Professor Eder. <clears throat> I, I have seen this machine three years ago in uh, Naples. I, I still remember it's a very, very impressive yeah, I, I heard the, there is a, a similar uh, one. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, maybe uh, it's only for clinical trial in the China, the PRA General Hospital. I'm not sure if this is exactly the same one. Or, it is, uh, yes, it is the same machine. We ran a clinical trial there, and um, we have um, our clinical, we have a pending decision from the NMPA to get final regulatory clearance. Uh, we in fact have to do one last test, a electrical test to make sure that the electrical systems are safe. Uh, but that's been a little difficult because Beijing is locked down or has been more or less locked down for the last uh, several months. But once we do that test, we will have regulatory clearance in China. And so I, we've sold 40 machines in the world, but I promise you we'll be selling many more and uh, we'll look forward to visiting you and telling you more about it. 
Thank you. Yeah, it's amazing. Huh? So basically, it's uh, it's for radiotherapy, but it can be used for not only uh, neurosurgery, right? It's for it's for it's only for the brain and head and neck. So it's for neurosurgeons, ENT doctors, and and radiation oncologists treat brain and head and neck tumors. Okay. And it's also going to we're also treating, and I'm hoping to it, someday at Washon Hospital put a machine there and treat uh, neuromodulation. So the idea of down-regulating brain circuits for oh. depression and addiction. So we have many ambitions. I have big ambitions for China and I can't wait to visit. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, yeah, pay for, for two, two and a half years, I've not been back to China. Uh, yeah. I mean, in 2019, I was there 10 times. So it's, I can't wait to see China again. Okay. So and, Ming Wang is a good friend of you. Wang Enming oh, yeah. uh, for Huashan Hospital. He is in charge of the, <clears throat> he's a chief for the CyberKnife. I know well, yes. And I need yeah. to visit him. <laughs> you can tell, if you see him, tell him I, I can't wait to see him. Okay. <laughs> Thank I want to drink some Mao Tai again. Mm -hmm. We want to drink okay. some Mao Tai. Okay. <laughs> you like Mao Tai. Okay. Uh, with good <laughs> friends, yes. Okay. Right. Oh, another question is about the, the cure, uh, curious. Uh, so I know this is a, like a new uh, uh, internet uh, journal, or, uh, right? And uh, you are the chief editor. So uh, how many uh, uh, articles uh, published? Uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the submission uh, come from uh, China. As you said, there are more than um, 10,000 uh, publications already. Uh, well, very few. That's, uh, that's why I'm on this call, <laughs> because so, uh, I would like to publish many more. So China, if you can see, is only 1% of our submissions. You know, yeah, we can try. Yeah. Many more articles from um, uh, you know, Japan and uh, many more from the Britain and the UK and uh, in Germany, I mean, uh, China is very underserved. That's why I would like to, you know, let you know of what we're doing. So here, this is the slide. So you can see in there that yeah. if you see in this slide, you'll see China is very small, only 1%. Okay. Only 1%. So I want to change that. Maybe that because, uh, I mean, still, uh, China, is still, uh, most of us still not, uh, uh familiar with this uh, new uh, journal it's like a journal for uh, a general uh, medicine right or uh, or specialty in in medical uh, area right yes all specialties all we represent 61 specialties um, oh, but okay. we rep we published a thousand neurosurgery articles last year so still a lot of neurosurgery and okay. and and Everything is, we, we, double, we double in size every two years. John, it started as a neurosurgery journal, right? 100%? Started 100% as a neurosurgery journal. It started in the Department of Neurosurgery at Stanford. That's where I started the journal. Yeah, I think the SIQ is a very creative uh, uh, idea. To make the make the reader to uh, make the score of the article. Maybe that's something our journals could share together. Yeah, I'd like yeah, it to make it a new. Yeah. yeah, we are still a small journal. You know, Chinese men, uh, neurosurgical journal. We we uh, we got uh, around two hundred. Uh, publication uh, submissions every year and only publish uh, the, about 40 uh, four zero uh, articles uh, in last uh, six uh, no not last three four years so yeah we we just we are still growing up. yeah so Yuan Li, yeah. who's who is your publisher who is your publisher Oh, uh, we co-operate oh, oh, with the, you know, the Biomed Central, it's a, a BMC. Well, if you want a new publisher, I'd be happy to be your publisher and I'll publish for a lot less money. 
Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we do that. Sounds like a winner. So we <laughs> we work with uh, a number of medical societies too. So mm -hmm. a number of state medical societies, the radio surgical society. So there are other organizations, a number of medical schools. So we publish journals for in a, duff, in a number of different situations. And we do it for very low cost. You can yeah, maybe with me and you can tell me how much you spend, and I'll tell you it's too much. <laughs> I can do much better. Yeah. I'm maybe sure you can I call can... cooperate with the Asia Journal of Neurosurgery, ACNS, AC, uh, AC, uh, ACJ, yeah. I would love to. Asia Journal of Neurosurgery, yeah. yeah. So you should check out Curious. We'll see. We have what's called a channel, mm -hmm. and a channel is like a journal. It's a small journal. A, it's it's a it's a part of Curious that's dedicated to a specific medical society, to a specific medical specialty. And we could easily make a Chinese journal of um, uh, neurosurgery. And it will be very low cost, super low cost. So, so Professor Edra, would you please uh, share the last, the last one uh, with your uh, website? Yes, sure. It's, I'm sorry. Oh, and, and I saw a question from uh, yeah. okay. some, some uh, Hashan Hashan. Uh, he 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 asked, uh, "Do you accept case case report or only research article?" We accept case reports, absolutely. Yes. In fact, oh. remember the uh, where I'm, the the report of anesthesia was a case report. So. When, when the most important article ever published in the New England Journal of Medicine was the description of anesthesia. And it was a case report. So we believe that case reports can be extremely valuable. And yes, about 30% about of what we publish is case reports. Okay, thank you. Thank you again. Okay. Uh... So yeah, mm, now uh, thank you again. Yeah, hope you can visit China as early as possible. Oh, yeah. President Xi, to let me in. I want to visit. <laughs> okay, okay. okay. <laughs> but I can't do thank three you. weeks. Of, no three weeks of quarantine. That's too much. Too much. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, now let's thank move you. Thank you the, very much. Yeah. Thank you. Move to the second uh, uh, speaker. Professor Ying Yan Wang, it's from Tiantan Hospital, a Capital Medical University. And uh, today he will talk about a uh, radiomix based biomarker prediction model for glioma and its application in surgery. Dr. Wang, uh, please. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, good evening, professors and audience. Uh, I'm very honored to be invited by Professor Zhao and Chinese Neurosurgical Journal to share our work. And today uh, I'd like to share uh, our work titled by Radiomics based biomarker prediction model for gliomas and its application in neurosurgery. So uh, first to introduce a little bit of myself, I'm uh, Wang Yinyan, uh, a neurosurgeon from Tiantai Hospital. And uh, I worked in the team of Professor Jiang Tao and uh, recently, we published a paper named Role of Molecular Biomarkers in Glioma Resection. It's a systematic review published on Chinese, Chinese Neurosurgical Journal. And we think it's a creative topic because recently we found that when we know biomarkers before the surgery, it may guide our surgery um, in the future. So we investigate on this topic for many years and try to uh, investigate more. And our teams consist of two parts. One is clinical neuroimage parts, and the second one is genetic analysis parts. So I'm from the radio genomic parts and which are uh, consist of two groups. And then we call it radio, radio genomic group. So we are working on this glioma treatment pipeline. 
So now we first have MRI and then we perform surgery. And then we got pathology of glioma. And then we know uh, and give a best treatment for the patient with adjuvant therapy. So under this pipeline, we have performed many surgery, but now we have a question that whether we can predict pathology before the surgery and whether the results that our prediction can guide the surgery. So with this question, we review many papers and we'd like to perform our investigation and maybe in future it can change the pipeline of glioma treatment. So we uh, would like to solve the problem, but first we have to uh, make a steps. The, the first step, we would like to know the anatomical relation of biomarkers in glioma. The second step, we would like to know the morphological relation of biomarkers on MRI. And the third step, we want to know the radiomic correlation of biomarkers. And then with all this knowledge, we would like to establish a radio, radiomic based AI prediction model for gliomas. So maybe we can know more biomarker information before the surgery. So in the first step, we, we try to establish a voxel level mapping of tumor related biomarkers. It started in 2014 and duration is three years. And we published nine papers on how the uh, voxel level mapping of tumor related biomarkers are. So our idea from a New England paper that gliomas may originate from SVZ. SVZ is a special specific area in the brain. And with many evidences, we have a hypothesis that when glioma start from the SVZ, it moves to other area of the brain and cause many gliomas in different brain lobes. And what we want to do is to perform and generate an atlas. This atlas shows that when a glioma originates from one brain area, how many percent it can be added mutated or other biomarkers expression. So we choose 10 biomarkers from our published guidelines, the CGCG guidelines, which is used in China. And then we uh, perform uh, normalization. We input MRI images and normalize them into MRI standard space. And then we separate them into high expression and low expression of specific biomarkers. So in this regression, we can know in each voxel that how, uh, how many percent of the tumor are expression of one biomarkers, high expression of one biomarkers, that in other areas, it may be low expression of biomarkers. So with this fitting model, we can know in where the glioma originated that it may be uh, start with IDH mutation or 1P90Q codilation. So our one paper published on AGNR, that was first a paper of the series publications that we found in temporal lobe that P53 mutation is much more higher than glioma originate from other grain lobe. So this paper are highlight by the editor of AGNR, and the next year he got the Lucian Levy Best Research Article Award nominated. And then we try to use this method to see the association between biomarkers and brain regions. There is a, this is our another paper that shows the P10 mutation and EGFR exponentation, which area of those biomarkers are highly occurrence. So here is our funds that this series article shows the specific area of the brain are associated with it, are associated with a specific biomarker mutation. So that was the first step of our investigations. And our second one is radiogenomic correlation of tumor related biomarkers, which is started at nine, uh, two, 2015. 
So the duration of this is also the three years and we published eight papers on that topic. So uh, for example, we would like to see how the MR features are associated with VEGF expression. We can see on this slide that there is necrosis area, tumor contrast enhancement, and the T2 abnormal signal areas. So we calculated the ratio of necrosis areas to enhancement areas. And we found this ratio are highly associated with VGF expression. And on SWI, the specific MR image, and we can see there is a score ITSS, which is also highly associated with bell markers like IDH, MGMT, and 1P19Q. So we can see that with multiple sequence of MRI, we can know many evidence that how glioma bell markers expression. So these are publications on this topic. And then we move to the next step that how MRI assist predicts molecular bell markers. So firstly, we abstract bell uh, radioomic features from MRI, which is more than a thousand. And then we use these features to establish an, an AI model. And use this AI model, we can know that uh, how bell marker expressions before the surgery. So take example that this is our one investigation that we would like to know the radiogenomics features of P10 mutation in glioblastoma. So we first draw the tumors on CE and on T2, and then it was checked by radiogenomic uh, radiologist. And we use TCGA data to be training data and CGGA data to be validation data. And then we can have a feature selection model and we structure, we, we uh, construct a model with SVM. And by MRMR, we establish a prediction model, which was a highly uh, a prediction effective. And then we establish an AI prediction model for P10 mutation, which can classify whether this tumor has P10 mutation before the surgery. And we also found it's associated with cell motion and signal cascade. Then we use the same method on P53 and establish a model to predict P53 status in LGGs. And then we also publish paper use DCNN to predict IDH ones. So here are all the bell markers that we can predict now. And use these models, we can predict more than 10 bell markers before the surgery. So now we move to the treatment pipeline of glioma. So based on our investigation, it's possible that we can use the preoperative MRI features to predict pathology of the tumor and how this knowledge can change the surgery. So we perform another uh, investigation. The first one is uh, we uh, combine with the Huashan Hospital and publish a paper on 2008. 18, that we can, we can know that 1P19Q status are highly infected, whether the patient has any benefit from total resection. And we found that when patients have 1P19Q co-deletion, it may not benefit from total resection, but have more chance to, uh, to uh, a functional a dysfunction of the patient. And then there is another paper published on JAMA College, which shows that when the patient has IDH mutation, whether we choose graft cellular resection in glioblastomas. So it found in a specific group of patients, uh, cross-total resection is benefit to the patient, but in another group of the patient, cross-total resection is not benefit. So especially for IDH white type group, so we review this article and published on Chinese Nurse Journal that whether we should choose 
a super resection or we should choose a total resection, subtotal resection, or we only have to resect enhancing area. But the evidence level of those articles are now so high, there is no RCT investigation. And then we perform the investigation with our database, CGGA database. So we collect all low-grade gliomas and IDH mutated and IDH wild-type gliomas, which is now the high-grade. And then we want to see whether total resection are benefit to the patient with specific classification of the biomarkers. And we found that when we only see the pathology type and all of the total resection are benefit. So we would like to see specific in specific group, whether this total resection still work. So we um, further separated patient into specific groups, like the group with KPS less than 18, 80, and age larger than 45 years old. And we found that uh, for the patient with KPS less than 80, they're generally Gross total resection is not that benefit. But for the patient with a good KPS and a young patient, general, generally gross total resection is works. And specifically on this uh, figure, we can see that this is our result based on our CG, CGGA database, which consists of more than 3,000 uh, patients' data. So we published this paper on cancer letter and would like to push this topic a little bit forward. So uh, this is our result and uh, this is all I want to share with our audience and uh, host today. And thank you for our team and all the work are uh, performed by our team that we published more than 60 papers for reason five years. And there is a four uh, with impact factor higher than 10 papers. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Wang. And uh, that's interesting. Uh, you know, last week, uh, uh, for two weeks ago, we also have another uh, professor, Guo Mian, from Harbin Medical University. He also uh, talked about uh, the uh, glioma stem cell, uh, <clears throat> the basic research. So, um, Dr. Wang, can you give us a little bit more uh, an explanation about uh, what uh, what about your opinion uh, for the uh, glioma uh, stem cell? Can can we uh, actually use some uh, special uh, technique to uh, identify them? I mean, uh, also thank you. for the okay. I mean, like for. Uh, for its application to the surgery, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Zhao. Uh, it's, it's a very good question and it's very hard to answer right now because tumor stem cell is uh, it's a long story and uh, we think there exists a tumor stem cell and with those tumor stem cell, the glioma are originated and developed into different types of glioma. So, uh, the idea is that when we can uh, kill the stem cell of the glioma, then maybe we can kill the all gliomas. But uh, we found it's harder than what we thought because there may be multiple types of glioma stem cell and maybe more than one glioma cell in the, in the tumor, in one tumor. So it's difficult to, to see or to make those tumor stem cell appearance in the tumor. So it's difficult to know whether uh, or say uh, what, uh, where those tumor stem cell are. So then um, I think when we can kill those all tumor stem cell is maybe we can kill all the tumor cells. But the first question is how that we can localize those tumor stem cells. So if we have a technology to deal with this problem, maybe you can um, success. Okay, thank you for your question. Okay. Uh, and we had a question from, from the panel. 
is this prediction confirmed by histopathology to a uh, correct, uh, yeah, I guess, uh, okay. He asked about yeah, the, your, your prediction confirmed by the, the pathology. Oh. Okay, so uh, I should firstly say all those prediction models are generated from the pathology because uh, we have uh, MRI features and we have a pathology and we, we use those MRI features to predict the pathology. When we're trying to do this, our old markers are based on pathology. So all our models actually are based on the pathology results. Um, and then we uh, validated our models uh, by the database from other hospital. And we think um, when more than one hospital can repeat this result, it's maybe more uh, validated. And, okay. Thank you. So do we have any more question? Uh, okay, so thank you again, Professor Wong. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so uh, Dr. Shui, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Wang, for your very nice presentation. And uh, it's, uh, I think it, it represent, uh, represent the maybe future of the, uh, for this kind of glioma treatment. It's a, a very uh, important uh, site for this uh, future treatment of uh, uh, gliomas. So now the third speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Xu Feng. Uh, he is an associate professor of Huashan Hospital of Neurosurgical Department and my younger colleague. Uh, he is a very talented hybrid neurosurgeon uh, and uh, he can both do the uh, very good open surgery for clipping aneurysm and the, uh, also the interventional treatments, uh, even the bypass. He can also uh, doing very well uh, ind independently. Uh, my another younger colleague, Dr. Liao Yuqing, he also did a lot, uh, a lot of translation work for this neurosurgical uh, TV. Zhang is a very familiar with him. So now, please, Xu Feng. Uh, okay, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Yeah, yes. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for the invitation of Professor Xu Bing and uh, Zhao Yuan Li. And uh, thank you, everyone. So uh, as my leader introduced, uh, we performed both the open surgery and uh, the endovascular procedure. So today my topic is surgical clipping of the periclinoid aneurysms in the stent flow diverter area. Uh, the periclinoid aneurysm is defined as an aneurysm arising from the segment of the ICA between the distal ring and the origin of the pecan. So it's also called ophthalmic cell segment aneurysm, or sometimes a proximal ICA aneurysm, ventral ICA aneurysm, and a corticoid cave aneurysm. And uh, according to the classification of the segment of the ICA, uh, the C6 ophthalmic segment is called as uh, perkinoid aneurysm. And this is a anterior posterior view. And this is a lateral view of the segment of the ICA. And we can see the C6 segment is called ophthalmic artery segment of the ICA. And uh, in our group, the treatment category was uh, described as follows. And most of the Paraclinoid aneurysm were treated by the endovascular procedures. For small and medium sized uh, aneurysm, we first uh, choose the stand assist coiling, including the laser cut stent or braided stent. 
for large or giant pericardinal aneurysm, we usually perform the fluid diverter. But in some cases, uh, some indications the surgical clipping is preferred and the bypass is the last choice. Uh, as shown in the figures, for small and medium sized the uh, C6 aneurysm, the Emperor's and the Neuroform Atlas is open open cell stent. Uh, also can achieve the good results. And the braided stents such as Elvis and Leo can also achieve the good results. And for the large or giant aneurysm, the pipeline and the fluid diverter is the first choice. And the pipeline is also everybody knows. And the Made in China two bridge and the figure showed the tandem intracranial, the pericardinal aneurysm and the pipeline was used. And this is also two tandem the aneurysm, the two bridge was used. And sometimes the coils, uh, assist, stand assisted coiling was used for a large or giant pericardinal aneurysm, especially for aneurysm with the jet signs. And uh, however, in some situations such as the multiple intracranial aneurysm and peptic ulcer and antiplatelet allergic or large sac narrow neck and interflow jet and economic factors and a surgical clipping was used. And the most used the classification is a Brahmi classification in 1994. And the type 1A is the aneurysm arising from the superior ophthalmic segment of the ICA and are related to the ophthalmic artery. So it's also called the ophthalmic artery aneurysm. They were either media or lateral to the optical nerve. And the type 1B, type 1B is had no relation, branch relationship, the projected uh, superior and were lateral to the optical nerve. And the type Type two, type two is aneurysm arising from the ventral segment of thalamic segment of the ICA. And the type three, type three A is the, the aneurysm projected medially over the dorsum cell. So it's arising from the media segment of the of thalamic, uh, segment of the ICA. And related, so it's called the superior hyperphysial artery aneurysm. But type 3B is arising from the C5 segment, also called the clinoid segment of the IC. The projecting medially uh, infradiaphragmatic. And the type 4 is, uh, uh, or we can call it, it, belo it belongs to the C5 or C4 is a cavernous sinus segment. So I will show some illustrative cases. And this patient was a 44 year old uh, female and has suffered the vision decrease in the left eye. And we can see from the uh, DSC and uh, we can, uh, the jet sign is the, the narrow neck with the inflow jet. So we are worried about the post-operative hemorrhage after the flow diverter. So the surgical clipping was chosen. And we use the, uh, the superior orbital letter approach. And this is an aneurysm, the IC, uh, ICG. And we can see the video. And the severe dye fissure was dissected from the distal to the proximal uh, fashion. And the optical system and the cortical system was open to expose the 
I see an aneurysm. And we can see here the aneurysm. And the anterior, the dual covered anterior clinoid process was incised. And a high speed diamond drill was used to remove the, the media, media aspect of the anterior clinoid and the letter of the optical canal. And we use a sharp dissection to remove the, some part of the anterior clinoid process. Sometimes it's adhered to the dura. The germ is used to from the hemostasis. And the falciform ligament and the distal ring of the distal ring was opened to expose the proximal neck of the aneurysm. And the PCOM artery. The A1 was temporarily occluded, and we, we are exposing the distal neck of the aneurysm and the proximal neck of the aneurysm. So a straight clip was used to be parallel to the ICA, to reconstruct the ICA. And the temporal clips was were removed, and the ICG confirmed the total obliteration of the aneurysm. And then we puncture the aneurysm and dissect the aneurysm dome from the A1, and the optic nerve, kinematic. Now another clip was used to inform, in, reinforce, and then we incise the aneurysm body. Okay, and this is another case, a 56 year old female complained of intermittent headache. The patient was admitted in 2017. At that time, the fluid diverter is not available. So we performed the operation in a hybriding room and it's a, it's a giant ophthalmic artery aneurysm. And this is 
uh, after the remove remove of the anterior canal process, the proximal and distal aneurysm was exposed, and multiple clips was used to reconstruct the IC. And uh, this is the intraoperative DSA in the hybrid room, and we also use. Uh, the balloon guiding catheter and I use a retrograde suction to decrease the intracranial aneurysm pressure to facilitate the clipping. And this is a five years follow up, we can see no recurrence. Uh, it's also another large pericardial aneurysm because of the economic factor. A two clips, straight clips, was used uh, to clip the aneurysm. This was done in in foreign province. And that 1B, and we said it has no relationship with the uh, off-semic segment, but it's um, uh, the aneurysm projected laterally. And uh, this is after the operation, the ICG, and we can see the video, show some video. And uh, the key point of this type of aneurysm is to remove the, the lateral and the posterior aspect of the anterior clinoid process. As a high speed as a diamond drill was used. And this is the optical, optic nerve canal. Uh, the roof has been unroofed. Uh, the anterior canal process was here. It's removed. And uh, another key point is to expose the proximal in, uh, neck of the proximal neck. We should dis dissect the plane between the aneurysm dome and the cavernous sinus roof. And here is to expose the proximal neck and the uh, A1, uh, M1 was uh, pre uh, uh, temporarily occluded. And uh, we use uh, Dallas, Dallas, the ICA uh, retrograde suction to facilitate the clipping. And uh, first, uh, the pilot clipping use a uh, straight, straight, a long straight clip was used to clip the aneurysm neck. And we here uh, another uh, straight clip was used to reinforce the clipping. So the temporary clips were removed. And we can see here is the dog ear, the residual neck. to expose the perforator. The ICG should know feeding of the interaneurysm, the contrast the angels. Another mini, another straight clips was also used to totally or clip, clip the aneurysm neck. So uh, it's another case, aspirin allerge. So also type 1B. And we can see here the aneurysm. And this is the aneurysm after the uh, removal of the anterior clinoid process and expose the proximal neck and a uh, perpendicular fenestrator. And another perpendicular was used. And uh, this is the post operative CTA, totally obliteration. Uh, also, another case of the 1B because of the peptic ulcer. 
52 years old male, and then two uh, perpendicular was used to reconstruct the IC parallel to the IC. And it's also a ruptured and ophthalmic artery uh, type 1B, a perpendicular clips were used. And this is another ruptured uh, when I was in Xinjiang province and the uh, pipeline was not available. It's a ruptured type 1B, it's a giant aneurysm. We also use uh, uh, two clips, straight clips to were used to be parallel to the IC and the total clip is an aneurysm. And the type three is located at the ventral, ventral surface of the IC. We can see here is a multiple intracranial aneurysm. It's MCA, tiny aneurysm, and a PCOM aneurysm. And a, it's also type two, the pericardial aneurysm. So it's a curved, a curved clips was used first to clip to the MCA bifurcation aneurysm, and a straight clip was used to admit to the PCOM aneurysm. And a, a oblique uh, fenestrate clip was used to clip the pericardial aneurysm. And this is a post operative angiography showing total obliteration of all these three aneurysms. And this is a, another case of the recurrent aneurysm after a coil embolization, uh, type two. We also used a perpendicular fenestrate clip to clip the aneurysm. And the type three A, uh, as we introduced, uh, uh, is also called the superior hyperphysia artery aneurysm. Is projecting the medially, and then we can see here, medially, inferiorly. And uh, this is a large uh, pericardial aneurysm and a complainant of 49-year-old female complainant of the intermittent headache because of economic factors, uh, worried about the pipeline, the high cost. And so we performed the operation uh, in the hybrid room. And uh, this is a post-operative, and we can see the video. And uh, we also dissected the CVM fissure from the from the distal to proximal fashion. And we open the optical system and the carotid system to expose the optical nerve and the ICA. Uh, this is aneurysm. Now it's inside the dual cover the anterior uh, clinical process. And the key point of this type of aneurysm is that to remove the lateral aspect of the optic canal and uh, the extent of the removal of the anterior Clinoid process is not not too much, it's just some a minimal aspect of the. Uh, sometimes you even you didn't you don't need to remove the anterior clinoid process. And this is a falci ligament. Falci from ligament was open. And the distal ring, distal ring was also open. And we elevating the optic nerve to expose the proximal neck and the posterior. Uh, a pilot, Pilot clipping, I think the, the first the fenestra clip was, was mostly important because I always used to reconstruct the ICA. If there is a stenosis of the ICA, uh, you should adjust the clip. And the second was used in parallel and in condemned fashion. And this is the third to avoid uh, occlusion of the 
perforators, anterior coiled artery, or the perforator from the IC. And this is after operation, and the ICG. And this is another case. Uh, before the general anesthesia, the patient falling unconscious and they, uh, from the unruptured to ruptured, we perform the emergency aneurysm clipping and also expose the aneurysm use three perpendicular fenestra clips to reconstruct the aneurysm. We also perform the operation in the hybrid. This is post-operative angiography. Uh, it's also another case in Huashan Tendan Hospital Conference. And this is a uh, uh, multiple intracranial aneurysm, the giant uh, uh, the type 31A, but also have the A3 segment and the, the anterior uh, clinoid artery aneurysm. Uh, fluid diverter was not used because of the tortures of the ICA. And we use the one fenestrate the perpendicular and a two curve to reconstruct the ICA. And this post-operative angiograph shows the total optical relation of the aneurysm and the parent artery patency. And the type three, I think, is most uh, difficult because you you need to expose the C five uh, open the Proximal, proximal ring. And this, the patient was a 49 year old, complained of headache, irregular shape, daughters, and also a perpendicular fenestra was used. This is the post operative. And a contralateral approach is also can be performed to expose. For this patient, it is a right side MCA bifurcation aneurysm, we can see here. And we use this lateral superapital approach here, aneurysm. And uh, a straight clip was used. This is the ICG. And uh, we also find the contralateral, the uh, C6 aneurysm here. And uh, we uh, expose the inter optic uh, fissure and expose the aneurysm and uh, a straight. Also, maybe sometimes to clip to the aneurysm. This is a post-operative CT issues. Uh, the aneurysm was totally good. And the key points of the surgery of the clipping of the paracanal aneurysm is the individualized anterior clinoidectomy. The extent of the clinoidectomy, I think the type four is the most uh, is larger than type 3B and the 1A, 1B, and then the last is the type 2 or the type 3A. And the second key point is wide opening the distal ring and exposing the proximal neck. For large or giant aneurysm, retrograde suction, dust technique, or balloon assisted may be useful. So I showed some uh, the figures of the the remove of the anterior clinoid process. So there are two approach. One is intradural, the end block removal. So you can see here from the optic nerve, maybe 10 millimeter and uh, transverse to the spherical fissure, optic fissure, and this. And this is uh, anatomy. You can see here in an end block. This is a uh, uh, Clinoid segment of the ICA, and this is uh, up to nerve. And sometimes we can use uh, extra dura anterior clinoidectomy. So maybe the posterior approach was used after the posterior part of the upper up the roof was removed and. Uh, this year because the time limit, the high. Mm -hmm. 
this is a temporal lobe. This frontal lobe is a, a high drain, high speed drill was used. And here we can see the superior orbit fissure. And last year, the anterior process was uh, involved. So uh, there are so many publications in the internet uh, literature review and uh, uh, the techniques such as the suction decompression and the retrograde suction, trapping evacuation and uh, Retrograde suction decompression uses balloon occlusion or temporary office the balloon occlusion at the neck of the aneurysm. And also the retro suction decompression uses a balloon containing guiding catheter. So conclusions, the clipping strategy for pericardinal aneurysm depends on the classification and the uh, aneurysm size. The clip application is used parallel to the SCA in type one, whereas the fenestra clips are used frequently in type two and type three. The balloon assisted retrograde suction decompression facilitates the clipping of the large and the joint pericardinal aneurysm. So now in China, in our group, uh, maybe 19, 95% or more than 95% was uh, preferred the uh, endovascular surgery. Clipping became more or less. So that's all. Thank you. This is our paper. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Shifeng. And uh, any questions? So we learned a lot from Professor Yuha and his name is uh, LSO approach. So normally you can see uh, Dr. Shifeng introduced uh, mostly adopt the approach is a lateral superorbital approach. And uh, uh, quite often we will do the intra, uh, intradural uh, remover of the anterior uh, clinoid process. And uh, this makes this uh, uh, procedure much shorter. And uh, if you use uh, richer suction uh, bloom, bloom uh, guiding wire, uh, guiding catheter, it makes the uh, uh, dome of the aneurysm re uh, relax and uh, uh, shrink very well. So it, it's uh, very helpful. We don't use adenosine uh, to stop the uh, heart beating. Excuse me, Ben. There's a question from uh, Mohammed in the chat. You want to read that, please? Mohammed, help me. Oh, that. Yeah, Mohammed, you can you can speak directly. <laughs> Are you there, Mohammed? Yes, hello everyone. Thank you for giving me this chance. Uh, I'm Mohammed Hadmi from Egypt, the master's degree student of Professor Binshu. Um, my question is, it was published that coiling increases the size of aneurysmal sac. So in case of aneurysms that compress the optic nerve, I wonder if coiling would increase the uh, uh, mechanical compression of an optic nerve. So uh, that in return will cause more visual deterioration. Uh, I ask uh, Professor Shu if he have noticed any cases like that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you for raising such a good question. For the, the giant aneurysm, uh, the, the compression of the optic nerve is a major problem. So for this, such a, so this aneurysm, we usually use the pipeline, but uh, 
maybe four coins or three coins, just partial coin. So we are waiting for the reconstruction of the fluid diverter. And then the, maybe you in the follow-up angiography, you will sh or MR image scan, you will find the shrink of the aneurysm body. So I think the optic nerve, the compression of the optic nerve is not a problem. Okay, thank you, Professor Fenshu, for your answer and thank you for your valuable presentation. Uh, Dr. Yes, for the, for the giant aneurysm, normally we prefer the direct uh, clipping because it's uh, more economical. So Dr. Shi, uh, also the two Dr. Shi, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. So I have a question about the, the Dolan's uh, approach. I, I saw your video, the, la the, the last part uh, you introduced about the, the Dolan's uh, approach. So I wonder if the, uh, what is the indication for you to choose uh, this uh, extra dural approach or for some uh, special kind of aneurysm? Are you just, uh, I mean, do it with a, a, like a personal uh, favorite. Oh, so, uh, yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Zhao. Uh, maybe three years before I was in the Little Rock City, uh, I asked the Professor Ali Christ, because uh, of semic artery aneurysm, the type one is dangerous, uh, is uh, projecting the superiorly. So when we use uh, Dolenka, approach maybe elevating the frontal lobe I asked him about the hemorrhage the during the operations of, he said it's no not a question never but uh, uh, for me I like to use the uh, epidural uh, the Dolenka approach for the type 2 or type 3 the aneurysm projecting the medially and venture venture and the media and uh, inferior of the ICA. And for the type one, the of semic artery aneurysm, I would like to use the intradural uh, remote of the ACP. Okay. Okay. Yes, uh, that's, that's a reasonable choice. If you want to expose the more proximal part of the ICA, you may choose the Dolenk approach. And if you don't have the uh, balloon catheter, you can use the Dolenk uh, approach to get the proximal control of the ICA. Yeah, Dolenk yeah. approach is always you to expose the cavernous sinus of the ICA. Yes. No need to expose the cervical ICA. Yes, that's a one stage treatment and uh, unnecessary to, if you don't have the hybrid room, uh, maybe this is a, a better choice. There's one question from Abraham. Do you see the question there, Ben? Uh, from Abraham, do you wanna ask that question directly, Abraham? Yeah, please open your camera and uh, see it directly. Are you there, Abraham? Yes, I'm here. Oh, good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the good topic and good presentation by Professor Shifan. Uh, I have one of my questions have already answered. My other question is about uh, the complication in this kind of type of uh, aneurysm, what what is the most complication have you been in your experience? Uh, yeah, uh, I uh, the refer in the earlier operations in my uh, the operation uh, for the preclinal aneurysm. I I remember the uh, uh, just the one case as in my video. Uh, in my PPT, the type 3B. Maybe okay. it's the second case. I I used the, uh, there, uh, no, no QSA, just the, the high speed drill. And uh, I used the M block, M block technique to the wider extent remove of the ACP. So the patient suffered the visual 
some extent, uh, some part of the visual loss. Okay, decrease the vision after the operation. So uh, the completion, I think uh, it's okay. In Alakush, uh, he said the paracanonic aneurysm belongs to, to the, he said uh, the chemical sinus is most dangerous, uh, more yeah. complex. Uh, because there is no, the aneurysm uh, is, is not like the giant <laughs> or ICA bifurcation aneurysm. I think you need to worry about the perforators the uh, for type two or type three, the fenestrate is uh, so easy, and uh, the ophthalmic artery sometimes is difficult because you is facing toward your uh, optic field, and uh, so you are worried about the intraoperative rupture of the aneurysm. So I think you uh, op uh, operate him so carefully. It's okay. All right. And my other questions uh, is about uh, the time, because uh, maybe my experience, I think in my country, like in Africa, most of the cases always arrive when like the symptom is more worse than the, the, the time, because I, I have been seeing in most of the cases in China, they, most of the cases, some of them, they don't have even like any symptoms. But uh, in Africa, most of the patients arrive like so late. Did you, what do you suggest for someone who having like having more experience like yours to approach this kind of type of uh, aneurysm? Did you think it's necessary to take them even like is uh, always late or just perform any type of surgery for, for that kind of surgery uh, case? I think with the development of the embolic uh, materials and the technique and then surgery, surgery is no need for this type. Okay. Uh, I think endovascular is the first choice. The first choice. All right. Thank you, Professor Suifeng, and good You're topic. Welcome. Very interesting for, for this topic. Thank you so much. Okay, Ben. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the, all the three speakers. And uh, uh, this is a very uh, successful webinar again. And uh, tonight we already have uh, uh, more than 1,123 one viewers. Yeah. Great, a great session, so, uh, Ben. Yeah, do, you, yeah. do you wanna wrap it up now, Ben? Yes. Okay. Very good. Professor like to... Tao. Yeah. Actually, mm -hmm. we have a uh, last question from oh, I'm sorry. another. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Dr. Ma. Actually, he's right here. Why? Why did? Why don't you just ask by yourself about CUSA better than diamond drill for ACP removal? Yeah, I think. Hello, I. Uh, this is Lima from. Chenton Hospital, because I'm a junior, so uh, I just uh, asked my question on the uh, paddle. So uh, I think Professor Xu has all answered my, one of my questions. And uh, my last question is, any comments on the uh, intra-aneurysm embolization? If there is some embolization already in the lesion, so is, will that cause some effect on or when we choose to clip it? And also, um, do we need to evaluate before the surgery about the calcification of the aneurysm neck, especially for the paraclinoid aneurysm. Thank you. Yeah, yeah uh, thank you. Thank you for a good question. And QSA is good. It's good at the end, the high speed drill, especially for if you have not too much, too many experience of the uh, removal of the anterior kind of process. But sometimes I think uh, QSA to remove the lateral uh, aspect of the ACP sometimes is difficult. So I, I would like to use to the drill, drill to remove the anterior 
ACP. And to remove the uh, 世柱, the just one. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, okay, for sure. Oh, uh, 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 yeah. <laughs> I'll start. I'll start. I think uh, the cues are sometimes uh, it's also difficult. So I, I would like to use a uh, uh, drill. And uh, aneurysm uh, embolization, uh, I, I introduced in our uh, treatment strategy for small and medium. We usually use it because smaller than one centimeter. I said the braided uh, stent, uh, such as the Elvis uh, or Leo, uh, was good. Uh, almost no recurse if you have the density and uh, embolization. But for large or giant, uh, I think the fluid diverter is the first choice. Okay. Uh, we also perform the CT scan, uh, clipping into see if there is any calcification of the aneurysm wall or intra-aneurysm thrombosis, uh, MRI image scan should also perform. And uh, we also perform the compression of the uh, carotid artery. Sometimes the BOT is also need to assess the collateral circulation before the operation, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Ben. Uh, do we have any more comments, qu closing questions or comments from anybody? Um, okay, for young neurosurgeons, normally they think the la uh, the giant aneurysm was terrified. But actually, uh, if you get the uh, very well uh, proximal control of the blood flow, and uh, if you uh, can get the uh, distal control at the same time, actually it's uh, it's not a big deal to treat the uh, direct clipping of the aneurysm. You can make a direct uh, uh, puncture of the dome and the, made the suction in the uh, surgical field directly. Okay, okay, very good. I'd like to thank you very much, everyone, Wan Li, Ben, especially, uh, Feng Zhu, Ying Yan, and uh, John Adler. And uh, Wan Li, I guess we'll see you in two weeks, right? Yes, yes. For webinar number four. Yes, we can see everyone after two weeks. Next, next Sunday. Yeah. Great. A great interactive session. I think John really enjoyed it. So okay. th thanks, everybody. And we'll see you in Thank two you. weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, see you in two ah. weeks.